بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على رسوله المصطفى وعلى عباده الذين ارتضى ومن بهدى ومهتدى وبآثار أهل المدينة اقتفى وبعد فسلام الله عليكم and welcome أهلا وسهلا بكم ومرحبا once again to session 10 of Al-Andalus from Rise to Fall the theme for today is we've titled it from Al Muravids to Al Mohads, a trend of theocracy. And what that actually means, we'll be taking a look at because we left off last session uh, with, with the rise of a new dynasty led by the legend Yusuf ibn Tashfi, an absolute hero, somebody who questions many narratives, somebody who crosses over to the Iberian Peninsula in his late 70s and then stabilizes an, a kingdom or stabilizes a peninsula that would have otherwise perhaps just fallen to tribulations, to further turmoil and peril. So this person, Yusuf Natashvin, he steps over, he goes across and he reunites this whole uh, or saves really the Muslims from some of the Umara, the leaders, he takes over, arrests, has uh, Mu'atamid, and we covered, uh, arrested and brought him back to Al-Maghrib, and we covered all of that in the previous session. And so, really, today, we're going to take, continue from there, we're going to see how this legacy continues from Yusuf ibn Tashfin, what he manages to do, we're going to see uh, some more disturbances which once again appear led by Alfonso uh, and some of the other Christians from the north we see that how Yusuf ibn Tashfin crosses over once again to in aid uh, of the, the Islamic cause we're going to see after that when Yusuf ibn Tashfin will then bequeath or really bequeath his legacy to his son he will nominate his son Ali ibn Yusuf to kind of become the new Amir and we'll learn more about his son Ali ibn Yusuf, who is then succeeded by Tashfin. And we'll also, during whilst this is going on, we'll be learning about some of the, the issues that were taking place, some of the rebellions, some of the Christian type of uprising, a bit more about El Cid, uh, the El, El, El Compiador. If you remember, we mentioned him in one of the previous sessions. Somebody who's a bit of a Spanish folkloric type of hero in this day and age people who there's a somewhat uh, people have kind of made songs about him they've made movies about him uh, programs dramas um, they've kind of poetries written about him a sense a great amount of art has been contributed to him El Cid but yet this person who is so glorified we will see this other side to him we will see this side on how he this treacherous uh, perspective on his lifestyle, uh, the way he's, his treatment of the Muslims and his whole incident of Valencia, which is in East Spain, uh, in East Al-Andalus. We will kind of learn about how he deals with the Muslims there. And then once again, we'll, we'll see how this whole situation is brought to an end, this type of Christian uprising and so on. But Amidst all of that, we will also learn about a new dynasty taking birth, really, within the Muslim empire. So you've got the Murabideen doing all of this, you've got the Christian uprising, this succession in legacy taking place, this all of this. Whilst this is happening, a person by the name of Muhammad ibn Tumurt arises in the Maghrib, close to Marrakesh, and this person, once again, will see his his calling his da'wah to a rule which is built upon religious grounds so we'll start to understand a bit more about this because what is a theology a theo uh, sorry what is a theocracy theology is obviously your belief but a theocracy is rule built upon the foundations of faith so it's not whereas a democracy is people electing or just basing their rule upon the wishes and the will of the people. A theocracy is where you are in essence, although this is 
impossible to say, but you are in essence basing it upon the will of God. Okay, so what we had seen previously in the previous sessions was the rise of many dynasties, like from the governance from the time of Bani Umayyah till the independence declared, and then the uh, Bani Umayyah once again, Abdul Rahman al Dakhil comes and he sets about a legacy. The dynasties that were established, Abdul Rahman al Dakhil, and then his son, his grandson, and then you've got the next Abdul Rahman, and then his children, then Abdul Rahman al Nasir, the absolute legend. And all of this is Bani Umayyah, the Umayyad dynasty. These dynasties were built upon bloodline. They were built upon tribal um, affiliation. They were built upon this type of, if you like, the Asabiya, which Ibn Khaldun speaks about, the type of um, the backing and support that you have, was really based upon initially, in its essence, tribal type of support. And then it became other people saying, yeah, we, we are pro Umawi, or we are this. And then after them, you have the, tw the 20 plus different kingdoms becoming scattered kingdoms, everybody calling to his own rule. Once again, the rule based on many people who felt oppressed, like the Barbar, they see his rule in certain parts, like uh, Qurtuba, you have some of the, the indigenous Spanish converts to Islam see his rule in certain places. You have other people type seizing rules, some of the Arab tribes. Once again, we are seeing ethnicities, we are seeing tribal bloodlines, we are seeing Arabs versus Berber versus non-Arabs versus clans within them. All of these things are the basis for rulership. This all changes with the legend Abdullah ibn Yasin, who we met and were introduced to in the previous session. Abdullah ibn Yasin in North Africa lays the foundations to a dynasty, the one which he couldn't even perhaps envisage would become so powerful as it does eventually ruling a third almost of Africa and the Iberian Peninsula. But he bases his dynasty not on bloodline, not on the Berber type of backing, not on so, not on tribalism or ethnicities. He bases it on Islam. He, his whole revolution was an Islamic and a religious revolution. So this is, if anything, it is perhaps the closest we will get to what will be a theocracy. Okay, so you've got this theocracy now. What we will see today is how Muhammad ibn Tumurt will also establish or set about the seeds of his new theocratic state. So we're seeing this trend almost emerge of theocracies. And then we will contrast that with the rule of Abdullah ibn Yasin. How did Abdullah ibn Yasin set it up and how does Muhammad ibn Tumurt? Because we will start to see a great divergence in their methodology. So Abdullah ibn Yasin set it on certain grounds. He saw that the people had kind of strayed from the deen and so on. Whereas Abdullah ibn Yasin with similar type of beliefs that people have strayed, but he comes about with this rigid extremism, declaring people to be kafirs, declaring the rulers to be kuffar, saying that they have become this particular sect or so on and so forth, and that they should be kind of um, they should be, uh, they, they should be, the authority should be removed, and all of this type of force-led approach. And then once again, we'll end with really the theme of deja vu. We'll start to see amidst all of this, Muslims start to once again face the turn of the tide. There are, there is a Christian backlash. We start to see certain Muslims rebelling within the rise of this person known as Muhammad ibn Mardinez, who was most likely of Spanish origin, becomes Muslim, but then has great allegiance still with the Christian North. And we start to see um, the turmoil that spreads. We see a dynasty almost beginning to crumble again. We start to see mistakes in leadership when kings start to choose their successors who are still people who are minors and people just in their early teens or just teenagers really to rule and lead dynasties which are so powerful 
So is this once again, when, is this just deja vu and history repeating itself, which it has a great tendency to do? So with that in mind, da'na nabta, and we will keep in mind at all times the words of Allah, wa tilka al-ayyam nudawiluha bainan nas. And those days we shall rotate them amongst the people. And for anybody really who feels history does not repeat itself, they really need to take a, clo a closer glance and just pay more attention to studying history. Because we will see repetitive themes, we will see repetitive successes and repetitive tragedies right throughout history. Right, let's return to the legend, the dawn Yusuf ibn Tashfi, somebody who he he had once again restored hope to the people of Al-Andalus. And look how old he was when he crosses over, in his late 70s. People, he continues to rule till 500 Hijri, which his total rule was for 47 years approximately, and he dies having passed really almost 100 years of age. During his rule, he manages to regain Saragusta, which Saragossa, with northeast Spain, and reaches with his rule the French borders. If you remember Tolaitala, which was more towards the central north, or the, really towards the center almost, the northern center of Spain, was one of the most fortified states within Al-Andalus. And although Yusuf ibn Tashfin does his best to reconquer Toledo, but Toledo, once it had slipped from the hands of Islamic territory, it was never to return again. And it was a huge loss for this Ummah. Now, with that said, <coughs> this was the type of things that begin to take place. Well, Yusuf ibn Tashfin, if you recall, was, had, was, was called back to Marrakesh because there were some internal incidents taking place which demanded that he was there, so he had to return. When he returns back to Al-Maghrib, so he's gone back, although he leaves some troops and people behind, but people of Al-Andalus see this as an opportunity, those who are not in favor of Yusuf ibn Tashfin, to kind of rise and rebel and once again strengthen themselves. So we see Valencia, which is in eastern Spain. Um, now, the ruler of Valencia, if you remember who we covered previously, his name was Qadir, and he was somebody who had a strong allegiance with Alfonso. Now, he also, at the time, if you remember, we covered in the previous sessions, had kind of sided up really with El Cid. El Compiador, and he had taken a lot of backing from him, he would pay him, have him deal with some of his battles, and these people, El, Compi El Compiador was really this person, El Cid, who, uh, his name was, I believe, uh, Rodrigo. El Cid is most likely taken from the Arabic, a Sayyid, meaning like the leader, and that's how they remember him today in Spain as El Cid. Now, what happens is El Cid, as, as you remember previously, had kind of, he was, he was somebody who was like a mercenary. He was happy to work for money. If the Muslims hired him, he was with them. If the Christians hired him, although his loyalty still always remained with the Christians, but he was kind of almost like semi-autonomous, independent. Now, Al-Qadir continues to do all these, lay these heavy taxes upon the people of Valencia and so on, and this really gets to people. They can't afford what he's doing. They see the oppression, they see his allegiances, and they say enough is enough. They decide to rebel, led by a Qadi, a Muslim judge, a Faqih, who kind of leads this rebellion against Al-Qadir, the ruler of Valencia, and they actually arrest him, put him under citizen's arrest. Now, and they now block off the city and take over. 
They call for the Murabidin. However, Yusuf Mutashwin has gone off to North Africa. The people that are in and the Iberian Peninsula, they're too few to kind of come in support. El Sid comes to realize what's happened. No, there's no way he's tolerating the loss of an ally in, in Valencia. So he gets his armies together and they go and lay siege to Valencia. Now, during this, the city is reasonably fortified. The Qadi seeks for help. He writes to all these different people. Nobody's coming to his aid. El Sid, they lay siege for up to 20 months. 20 months. It's just under two years. The people within Valencia are at, are at a stage of almost starvation. The historians write that people would do things like they had to eat rats. They ate dead bodies. That was the situation because the city was complete. It had it was blocked off on all fronts. Any person who tried to escape from the city was most likely caught by the uh, by the compradors armies, and they usually had him had them tortured and eventually executed. So they, there's reports of him having people who escaped. They caught them. They had they had kind of like had their eyes kind of burnt out, melted out. They had their hands cut off from different sides, their feet cut off at times. They had them kind of crucified and so on, the whole thing. This is what is taking place. Eventually, the people decide to have a type of truce. So they ask El Compidor, what, you know, if we ask for a truce, what, what's the conditions? And he agrees to some types of taxes and so on and the whole thing. As soon as they're about to open, because the cities, worked in stages so you had like the internal city then you had fort surrounding it and fort surrounding that and it was kind of fortified almost in a maze manner so as soon as they start to open some of the forts they see his treatment with the people and he and he starts to uh, come in and he and he changes his demands else it does he says oh i want this and i want this and as a um, almost as a guarantee i want the son of the judge the Qadi that's kind of leading this uprising to be held captive and I want this and I want this much money and which was much more than the city could handle. So they once again fortify the city, refuse him entry. But this fortification unfortunately could only last so long. El Cid breaks through in 487 Hijri and he massacres the people. Anybody that was of a fighting age is brought into the courtyard and massacred. Any male that uh, is of that, they, they repossess all the wealth that they can get their hands on. The Qadi that had led and resisted against him, the judge, the Muslim judge, he has in, a, in the central region of Valencia, in, in, in the center of the town, he has a type of ditch dug in which the Qadi is placed up to his waist almost, just, just below his chest, and he's buried there. Uh, so although his upper body is out of the ground, what he then has is around him, he has a fire lit, and he has the people watch this. So he's kind of burnt, uh, killed alive. And this, this tragedy befalls the people of Valencia. Now, whilst this is kind of going on right with all this going on this news reaches north africa it reaches yusuf natashvin who now crosses over again this is his fourth visit he crosses over he gets an army uh, who he puts and remember he is now the i mean this is almost 490 hijri He's crossing over. He's almost 90 years of age at this time. So he has a person by the name of Muhammad ibn al-Hajj lead this army. They take it, they, they head towards what was a, a town known as Qanshara, which was a close to, I mean, not far from Tulaytala, it was a strong Christian point, and they, and they meet their opponents there and managed to sustain a tremendous victory. Now this once again gives hope to some of the people. Whilst 
this had given hope. The tragedy of Valencia had also struck almost the fear of God into many of those people who were still refusing to be allies or kind of align with the Marabidi. When they saw what El Cid and these people had done, they feared that in case this happens to us next, they had declared their kingdom to be part of the Marabidi. So they annexed their kingdoms to the Marabidi. After that victory of Kanshara, Yusuf and Tashfin uh, dispatches the army towards Valencia. It's 493 Hijri. Years have passed since uh, the initial takeover by El Cid. Um, the armies lay siege. There are several battles which take place. El Cid faces like he, he faces like several defeats in these little battles. These type of like spra uh, sporadic battles which occur. He faces like humiliating defeat in them. They say, he, but he fortifies his city. He kind of locks himself in, the people in. They say he becomes so depressed and so kind of like taken uh, by the situation that he actually dies in that state. His wife, a woman by the name of Shaymana, takes over the rule. Now, Yusuf Natashvin sends more reinforcements. Over a year passes by. He sends somebody by the name of Abu Muhammad al-Mazdali, who kind of sends, who comes in with this huge reinforcement and they conquer the city of, uh, of Valencia. Now, this is people several years after its initial takeover and massacre. Now, whilst this is happening, this the year is 495 Hijri. Within a few years, Yusuf Natashwin is incredibly old. He nominates his, his son Ali ibn Yusuf to become the next ruler, who is not the eldest of his children, by the way. He's got other children, but he sees the most noble characteristics in him. And he nominates him, who is 23 years at the time. Within that year, Yusuf Natashvin passes away. He is buried in Marrakesh today. And Allahu Akbar, if you visit, and I have visited his, uh, where he's buried, and it, it's unfortunately just, just a little shack almost. And it's just watched over by by some people on a voluntary basis. In fact, it was this old lady that said she was from originally from the family of the Marabiti. And maybe not Yusuf Natashwin himself, but that whole tribe. And she said that their family had kept it uh, just within their tradition to watch over his type of grave and that, that place. And you'll see it today within, really it's towards central, towards the actual Medina of Marrakesh. And it's a really disheveled place. And it's so unfortunate such a shame that the people there have not and continue not to invest uh, not to invest in it you see the kings today haven't really spent much money on it and neither have, and, and I don't just mean in, I don't mean in fixing up the grave or when things like that necessarily I mean even you could make a whole museum in the sense of what he'd accomplished what he'd done who was he this man wasn't just nobody, he was a legend. I'm telling you, it is heart moving to go there and see how he is today. He's the person who built Marrakesh from scratch. I mean, he was the person who built it. He was the founder of the city. And there's no, and people haven't really batted an eyelid to him today. He was a legend from the legends of Islam. And when we kind of see, but it is, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give people the tawfiq to perhaps you know, revive the legacies that these people had conveyed. Now, coming back to where we were, so Yusuf and Tashfin passes away within that year. Ali ibn Yusuf is now the Khalif. He crosses over to Al-Andalus. And in Al-Andalus, things, although there's some stability, but the Christians are attempting to rise, there is some confusion that is taking place. Ali ibn Yusuf heads towards Toleitala, Toledo, and towards the east of Toleitala, there's a, a town called Oklaish. Uh, now, in Oklaish, this is 501 Hijri, there is a battle which takes place. And this battle, the Muslims sustain a huge victory. 
And in fact, it, is so, it was so huge in terms of what they managed to secure and the spoils of war that it really is almost a turning point because it gives so much hope to the people and it also destroys the type of aspirations that the Christian North had at the time. Now, that said, this you start to see in the ensuing, uh, I mean, just coming back to this Battle of Oklesh before we actually move on, several ulama were also kind of martyred within this, uh, within this battle. So we see that including people like um, you have uh, Abu Ali as a Sadafi is kind of um, but he's another, he's a legend of hadith and we'll speak more about him actually he's somebody who uh, we'll speak about slightly but in this in this battle you do see several ulama had participated as well and it showed the whole it showed that this wasn't just the dynasty wasn't just a political thing it was something that had grass root resonation so the people were resonating. And this Battle of Uqlaj, what had happened in it was that when Alfonso felt, because Alfonso was still alive, and he felt that, right, that the Christians were going to lose hope. I mean, at that time, the battle wasn't over. Um, he had actually sent his son, who was reasonably young at the time. He was just like 11 years old. And he was his sole heir, really, his only son. His name was Shanja. He'd sent him. To kind of show the people that look, we're going in wholeheartedly. And he also sent seven different counts, like seven rulers, and I mean like in like count as in a with a capital C as in those people of a status uh, that ruled over certain type of regions. There were seven major Christian counts that kind of took place or rulers in this battle, and that this battle almost becomes known as the battle of the seven rulers or the seven counts because there is a devastating loss that they face in the end there was one of them by the name of Barahanj they say in Arabic he was one like almost like Alfonso's military leading officer that who escapes and heads back to Tlaitala and in that battle as I mentioned amongst many ulama Imam Jazuli also kind of dies in that battle after this loss and tragedy of Oklaish, Alfonso VI kind of dies shortly after, really from all the tragedy that he's faced, the loss of his son, um, the loss of his kingdom. After him, what happens to the Christian kingdom is that the, it is taken is divided mainly amongst two people, both by the name Alfonso as well. One who they call, one who they call Alfonso the fighter or the warrior, and he really plays a key role in East and North Andalus. And West Andalus, which is known as Portugal, uh, modern day Portugal is taken over by Alfonso VII. Now, Alfonso the warrior or the fighter, he begins to seek help from the rest of Europe. So he starts to ask for reinforcements. He, uh, the, the Pope kind of blesses the war. They send in several people as reinforcements. And they start to kind of once again, uh, he starts to assemble an army to deal with the Morabiti. Now, when the army kind of reaches a certain number and strength, you see that the Morabiti try to go to face them. And there is a battle known as that of Qatanda. Right now, in the battle, of Qatanda, which takes place in 514 Hijri, the Muslims actually sustain a, uh, uh, and a tragic and terrible tragedy, a huge loss that almost up to 20,000 Muslims are martyred. Including, and this was the one in which Abu Ali as Sadafi, who is a huge legend in Hadith amongst Qadiyyad's teachers, is uh, martyred, as is uh, Ibn al-Farra, 
another major scholar. It was also a battle in which Qadi Abu Bakr ibn Arabi is present as well, and he writes that I was present in that battle and thousands of Muslims met their fate. He describes an Abu Ali as Sadafi is that legend of hadith. He was somebody who was known for his teaching of Sahih al Bukhari and he was such a hafid, he had memorized so many hadith, especially from the Sihah, that he would often say, You quote to me any text of hadith, just the text, and I will read to you its sanat, its chain. Or you quote to me any chain, and I will read to you its text. Right, so this kind of take, these were the type of legends that partook in that battle. Now, one of the things that, that kind of comes out of this battle, besides the tragedy and the loss that the Muslims actually lose in the Battle of Qatanda, and it's a huge, it begins, it's really the beginning of almost a turning point, that Alfonso, the the warrior, he, or the fighter, he reaches out to several non-Muslims residing within the Muslim state. And he kind of like asks them for their support and sends them money. And they begin to plot and conspire with him. So the Ahl of begin to betray on several fronts. And this leads to several other small towns and regions being attacked or lost to the Christian uh, assault. During this time, we actually see that Ibn Rushd al-Jad, the grandfather, pays a personal visit over to North Africa, where he visits Ali ibn Yusuf Attash, ibn Tashfin, and tells him, and actually advises him on certain grounds. And he tells him, he actually gives him three key uh, points which he had come over with, and one was that he advises about ostracizing, having these people um, kind of deported, these people of Zimma, who had betrayed the Muslim trust and the trust of the state, and many people, and some people today, sorry, not many, but some people today who raise these questions about, oh, the Murabid thing, and look how they dealt with the non-Muslims and the Jews and some of the Christians that lived within the... But if you read history properly, you will see that it was the betrayal to the state by these people, which constitutes treason, for which they were deported. So when people say, oh yeah, and even during some times that these people were deported and Jews were deported, because they were, because this was one of the three um, advisory points that Ibn Rushd al-Jad brings to Ali ibn Yusuf at Tashfin. And he tells him, one, that he should have these people deported, these people of Zimma. Two, that the walls, and I mean by the walls, like the walls of the fortresses and the cities need to be fortified. And three, that the ruler, the governor of Al-Andalus from the Morabitin, who was the brother of, um, uh, you, uh, who was the brother of Ali ibn Yusuf, his name was Tamim, should be replaced. Because really the situation in Andalus is quite turbulent and volatile. It needs a person of great determination. So Yusuf, uh, Ali ibn Yusuf accepts all of those uh, advisory points and acts upon them immediately. So he has the walls and the fortresses fortified. He has these people deported and he has his brother replaced. Right now, the thing... During this type of time also, 523 Hijri, we see a further split in the Christian kingdom. Uh, one of the Christian rulers known as Ibn Rink declares independence in the western part of Andalus, and which becomes known as the Kingdom of Portugal. And this was the birth of Portugal. Right, so Tamim now, however, that, so Portugal has become a separate state. Tamim has been replaced in Al-Andalus by Ali's son, his name is Tashfin as well. And this Tashfin people is a legend. Okay, so now, okay, let's return to the general situation. In 528 Al-Hijri, Alfonso, and this is Alfonso Al-Muharib, the warrior, he, gathers an army of 12,000 strong 
and heads and he starts heads towards Valencia en route conquering and taking over certain towns and regions and ransacking other villages and so on and really just just striking down upon people with great tyranny now whilst that is that is happening Tashfin has an army assembled and they meet Alfonso in a place known as Ifaraga with only 3000 Muslims and they say that Alfonso was so adamant of his victory that he had promised that victory is mine he had reassured the people that I victory is mine now during this he actually despite such type of haughty behavior and such confidence and having an army 12,000 strong and facing only 3,000 people, they actually face such a loss and tragedy that the Muslims sustain a glorious victory at the Battle of Ifraga and Alfonso al Muharib, the warrior, is killed. This Tashfin people that is now the ruler of the Iberian Peninsula, there's stories about him that there was a time once where he was leading a military type of campaign and it stopped and he'd gone off to this particular place like it was part of it was to be part of a military campaign but this wasn't actually an attack or anything and they get ambushed the year is 528 hijri and tashfin is ambushed at this place called bukar and all his army retreat and run away and they actually advise him to run and he says, if I run, what will happen to the Muslim territory which is behind me and surrounding us, except that it will be ransacked and destroyed and raped to the ground, that he stands his ground with only 40 men, 40 men. And they say he fought so passionately that the swords broke in his hand, several swords broke. And it was with this passion that the news spread to those behind him that then eventually came to his aid and they once again held their fort and defeated that assault. In the following years, in 539 Hijri, Tashfin, who had now become uh, the official ruler, he succeeds his father in rule. He, he also dies in 539 Hijri. Now, the person who he nominates to rule after him is his son, Ibrahim ibn Tashfin. Now, Ibrahim really was not eligible to rule because he was only 16 years of age and there was huge turbulence and volatility within the region of Al-Andalus. You see, within the following year, the, the Christians prepare such a forceful uh, attack upon the Muslim territory. There is a battle which takes place, place at Lej in which the Christians sustain a huge victory. And the year is 540 Al-Hijri. You see, during that time, this is really the beginning of a turnaround for the Christians almost. And you see that in the east of Al-Andalus, especially around areas of Valencia and, the, and this part, a person by the name of Muhammad ibn Martinez, um, he rises and declares almost independence. He was somebody who was um, really an, a, uh, an ally almost to Alfonso the seventh because if you remember Alfonso the warrior had kind of died in the previous battle when he had died what the other Alfonso had done was seize the opportunity Alfonso the seventh he seized the opportunity to kind of take over that territory the Christian territory and so Alfonso the seventh is an ally to this Muhammad ibn Martinez as is the ruler of Barcelona and he pays them heavy jizya, heavy taxes on an annual basis. He pays them up to 50,000 pieces of gold every year each. He was somebody that they say was of Spanish origin. Although he had converted, yet he was very much in line with the Christian trends. They say he would, he would prefer uh, Latin, especially the Castilian type of uh, 
language that they spoke, or the um, colloquial or of Latin that they spoke, he would prefer that and speak it very well. And however, he was a uh, history does document that he was a warrior. He was somebody that knew how to fight and he could hold his ground. And he was known to enter several battles and be hugely and highly victorious. And he kind of meets another person as well who has a similar type of mindset, somebody by the name of Ibn Hamshuk, who, Ibn Hamshuk, who also kind of declares his independence and starts having his own rebellions. And, and they kind of almost merge together. And, and we'll learn a bit more about that later on, where um, Ibn Ma uh, Martinez actually marries the daughter of Ibn Hamshuk, Ibn Hamshuk, and, Ibn Hamshuk and, we'll, and we'll, we'll cover that as time uh, goes on. In the following year, 541 Hijri, Ibrahim Ibn Tashfin is killed. At this time, the Murabitin era has come to an end. Right, the Murabitin from when it had really set up in 440 Hijri, but that was with Abdullah ibn Yas scene, to now 541 with the death of Ibrahim, it almost officially comes to an end. But meanwhile, a lot of things had been kind of brewing within the Muslim dynasty of the Marabiti. And in order to understand that, we've got to pause where we were in 541 Hijri. And we've got to skip and re rewind backwards, past or back into several decades. In the year 512, at the time of Ali ibn Yusuf Tashfin, a person has emerged by the name of Muhammad ibn Tumart. He was somebody that was really of an ascetic background, somebody very, um, he led a simple lifestyle. He hailed from the city of Al Medina al Mahdi in Tunis. And he had gone off to the Muslim world to kind of study. Now, the thing is that he did, he was very much into his studies. In fact, they say he was a great scholar of the deen. As somebody that, when I say great scholar, like he was absolutely well versed in the Islamic sciences. And they say he, he even studied from people like Al Ghazali and so on. And, and we will cover uh, that, although there is some dispute about some of the things that perhaps have have been kind of attributed, but I mean, we'll we'll cover that as time goes on. Now, Ibn Tumurt, after having spent years, really, in um, in places like Baghdad, he travels to Alexandria, then he goes to Mecca and Hajj, and then he goes to Baghdad, and comes back through Sham, and then stops once again in, um, stops again in Alexandria. However, in Alexandria this time, he starts his preaching, and he's actually somebody that people say had become a bit too extreme in his, um, he'd become a bit too extreme in his preaching, in his Amr bil Ma'ru. To the extent that people really start to get annoyed with him. And then he decides to catch uh, a boat back to, um, towards uh, Tunis and other parts of the Maghrib. And even the stories about how on the boat, he constantly just keeps on having a go at people about they need to read more Quran and do this and do that. And he's very religious in his outlook. Now, he comes back to Marrakesh. Now, in 512 Hijri, he really begins to rise in Marrakesh with his da'wah. And he starts to see that there are too many, although, yes, the Marabitin are still engaged in stuff like jihad and all, all of this. However, a lot of opulence and wealth has come into the dynasty. Right, so therefore, there starts to become a sense of relaxation amongst people. You start to see that there is a lot of alcohol, a lot of music, there's a lot of things like this going on, a lot of fitan, facade, corruption, some taxes are imposed on people and all of this. And this really annoys Muhammad ibn Tumart. 
if Muhammad ibn Tumart, what he starts to do is preach to the people, this and that. There's a, an incident where he actually sees this one woman who comes out not covered appropriately. They say her hair is showing and this and that. And he asks, who is this woman? Because she's in a bit of a crowd. And they say that's actually the daughter of Ali ibn Yusuf ibn Tashri. So this is how the situation kind of, what it comes to. So he starts his da'wah and everything and he returns uh, to just like sometimes the outskirts of Marrakush and continues his little da'wah and doing this and that. Whilst this is happening, he is brought to the attention of um, Ali ibn Yusuf uh, uh, ibn Tashfi, who actually invites him over because at this time they say he's got a little gang of followers but his, his followers don't really exceed anything like more than almost five or seven people now ali ibn yusuf invites him to his palace where he has him debate a muslim scholar by the name of malik ibn wahib now malik debates him and he actually loses muhammad ibn tumart or they say was an excellent scholar an outstanding scholar who defeats Malik in his debates. Now, when he's defeated, he then starts to have a go at Ali ibn Yusuf. They say he brings to him his attention, all these fitan and facade that are taking place, to the extent that it moves Ali ibn Yusuf, really. Um, and even Muhammad ibn Tumart becomes incredibly emotional whilst telling him all these things. One of the ministers advises Ali ibn Yusuf uh, that you should imprison him and give him a daily expense, like meaning to spend a dinar on him every day being in prison. He says that I advise you to do this lest you turn away now and then end up spending your entire kingdom and cannot still get hold of this person. At the same time, Malik ibn Wahib, who had debated him, advises Ali ibn Yusuf that, look, don't, don't come on. He says to him that, come to your senses. This is a man with a few followers only, that he is of, incapable of any harm to you. So Ali ibn Yusuf decides to go with Malik's advice and releases him. Muhammad ibn Tumurt resorts to a place outside of Mar Mar Marrakesh, uh, a few miles out really, not too far but not too close, by the name of Tain Malal. It's a place almost in a mountain. And there he begins to teach and so on and begins to get followers. He at this time is also met with another young man by the name of Abdul, uh, by the name of Abdul Mu'min ibn Ali al-Gumi. Abdul Mu'min is a Berber who is really passionate to learn about Islam. He comes to uh, Muhammad ibn Tumart because he hears of his knowledge and begins to study with him. Muhammad ibn Tumurt tells him, and this is really interesting people, he tells him that you, Abdul Mu'min, he says to him, I see at your hand, at your hand, great kingdoms will dilapidate. Great kingdoms will crumble at your hands. And he says, I see it very clearly before me. Abdul Mu'min ibn Ali becomes a very, like almost, not only just a keen and devoted disciple, but he almost becomes like Muhammad ibn Tumart's right-hand man. And they start to get more and more followers, and more followers, and hundreds, eventually thousands of people begin to follow them. He changes, Muhammad ibn Tumart begins to change his ideology. His ideology now, he begins to introduce several khurafat, several deviations, several heresies. If you recall, he had studied in several places throughout the Muslim world, places that were heavily influenced by also the Shia at the time, places which were influenced by um, the Mu'tazila, places that were influenced by several other sects also. That Muhammad ibn Tumurt, he one of his beliefs that he introduces is that he is the Mahdi. And he claims to be al-ma'asum, that infallible, that he cannot commit mistakes or errors or sins. 
and then so on. And he also begins to claim that the Murabiteen are Mujassima in the Aqidah. So he, he says that these people are a deviant sect and anthropomorphists and they declare Allah to ultimately have a body and so on and therefore they are kafirs. He does takfir on all of the authorities and he says they need to be replaced. You start to see in the following years several battles take place. All, up to nine battles are reported out of which seven are actually won by the Muahidin. You see, in 518 Hijri, there is a battle in which 15,000 Murabiteen are actually killed. And then several years later, in 524 Hijri, there is a battle at Buhaira, in which although, uh, the, although this one, the Murabiteen don't lose that battle, but and the Muahideen sustain a tremendous loss of up to 40,000 followers are massacred. In the same year, Muhammad ibn Tumurt also dies. So he doesn't actually see this success which he envisages, but he dies having left this type of legacy and followers. That's in 524 Hijri. Before he dies, he says that he is to be succeeded by Abdul Mu'min ibn Ali, who is a devoted and passionate disciple. Abdul Mu'min ibn Ali continues his attacks against Marrakush, which is the capital of the Murabiteen. In 541 Hijri, they deliver an incredibly forcible attack upon Marrakesh, in which Marrakush collapses. Most of the Murabiteen are killed, and Abdul Mu'min ibn Ali takes over. People we see during this era, several losses on both sides. Thousands of Muslims die, whilst Muslims are fighting Muslims. We see that the, we see due from the year 512, from the rise of Ibn Tumart, who, Muhammad, who is also known as Al-Mahdi Ibn Tumart, from then till 541, Hijri in these years in between until the Murabiteen, uh, until the Muahideen take over. We see that what is reported is almost 80,000 Muslims are martyred in total. Almost. Huge losses, huge, intolerable. You see, once again, a dynasty has risen upon religious grounds. But hey, Hat, what is the difference seriously between that and Abdullah ibn Yasin, when he kind of set about his dynasty, which he did. But what is the difference, subhanAllah? Here you have people declaring so-and-so to be kafirs, so-and-so to be deviant, and so-and-so, and this is how we'll kind of rise, and this is who we must kill, and Muslim fighting Muslim with heavy losses. And this reminds us of the words of the poet who has said, describing this situation, that Mata yablughul bunyan yawman tamama Ida kunta tabnihi wa ghayruka yahtimu Falaw kana alfuh Falaw kana alfun khalfahum hadimun kafa Fakayfa bibanin khalfahu alfu hadim You see, what he's saying is that he says that how, when will the structure finally reach its completion if you are trying to complete it and others are trying to destroy it? If there was a thousand builders and there was one destroying the building behind them, that was really enough. He says, then what would you say about a person, one person who is building behind whom there are a thousand destroying? Sometimes we see that there is huge Muslim energies and we see them sometimes rightly placed. Like when we saw Yusuf ibn Tashfin crossing over, when we see his son Ali ibn Yusuf in Uqlaish reconquering, when we see Tashfin standing his ground. All of these people, these legends, 
rising, as we've seen historically, Abdullah ibn Yasin, the spiritual teacher, directly or indirectly, with which you see there's a poem that a poet had written that Shababun Dhallalu Subal al Ma'ali Wama Arafu Siwal Islami Dina that people who had really set about the paths to greatness and hadn't known except Islam as a deen, Ida Shahidul Waga Kanu Kumatan Yadukun al Ma'akila wal Husuna that they would plunge into fortresses and really just display only valor wa in jannat dhalamu fala tarahum min al ishfaq illa sajidina that when it was dark you would only see them in sujood kadhalika akhraj al islam qawmi shababan tahiran hurran amina that this is how islam had brought about a generation it had brought about my people a generation of a pure and free and secure people. But when these efforts are misplaced at times or confused, we start to see people perhaps turning upon themselves. We start to see the rise of people like Ibn Tumur, who is successful in establishing a state. But upon the blood and the bones of many Muslims who went before him. What becomes of this dynasty that he has established, which becomes known as the Muahideen, the people of Tawheed? Do they continue to rule with this type of aqidah that uh, Ibn Tumurt had presented to them, of him being ma'soom, being infallible, of him being the Mahdi, of takfir? Is that what they then continue to establish? Would they impose that upon their people if they choose to do so? Would their dynasty manage to reclaim or restore stability to the turbulence which had now taken place in Al-Andalus? This we shall cover in the following session. Jazakumullah khair for listening. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Do remember me in your du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.